I'm talking to Zoe Carpenter from The Nation magazine, thenation.com. Let's move on uh, and talk about another <laughs> really disturbing story. Um, you recently wrote uh, about how... So there, so there actually is some talk in Congress about reforming the way sexual assault cases are handled. Um, but so, so, so for starters, let's discuss how currently how are sexual assault cases handled in the military if people aren't aware. So what happens if um, someone is sexually assaulted is that they have to report the crime to their commanding officer. And the commanding officer, um, in consultation with, with his staff attorney, decides whether those accusations warrant a, a trial by court-martial. Um, and the concern with that is that often, in about 25% of the cases, a, a, an attacker is within the victim's chain of command, um, which means they may have a relationship with the commander. They may, in fact, be the commander, um, as we've seen in previous cases. And so um, it leaves the victim um, vulnerable to retaliation and intimidation. And we've seen that only a small fraction of the estimated cases of sexual assault, assault in the military are reported. So we have about 26,000 cases uh, last year, and only um, about 3,400 were, were reported. Uh, sickening. So there is some talk in Congress, as we were saying, uh, Kristen Gillenbrand, the senator from New York, is is actually looking to reform that. What would, what would her bill do? So her bill would take the commander's authority to uh, decide when a case is prosecuted away from the commander and put it into the hands of a specially trained a military prosecutor. So it's someone who's still within the military, um, but it's someone who has legal expertise and who can weigh the evidence and really evaluate um, the legal implications of taking a, a case to trial. And so the thought is, is that would um, mean that cases would be evaluated based on evidence and that you wouldn't have those kinds of conflicts of interest that you see with keeping um, prosecution in the chain of command. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that seems to be a pretty simple thing to do. Um, you know, in some ways, I, you know, I, I would like to see it maybe even go out of the military and may, maybe into, into civilian court. That would be, you know, keeping it out of there. That would be my personal choice on this. But that seems, her, her, her proposal seems pretty simple. Uh, but you actually wrote about how there is actually quite a lot of resistance to this in the military. And not only is there resistance to it, they're actually, because of the hierarchy in the military, the the testimony coming out of this is actually very stifled in itself. So let's, let's talk, tell us all about that. Sure. So the top brass has been adamantly opposed to Jill Brand's amendment. Um, they are supporting some other reforms, such as removing the commander's authority to um, overturn a jury conviction of a an accused um, attacker. Um, but this particular reform, they have been very opposed to, and um, in their opposition, they are supported by some top Democrats in the Senate, including Carl Levin and Claire McCaskill, who support um, less strong reforms. But I, I spoke with a high-level officer in the Air Force who told me that um, there actually is support within the ranks for this kind of reform. There are commanders who believe that justice will best be served um, by empowering prosecutors instead of commanders. But because the top brass has made their position clear, they're not able to speak out. Um, and they're, you know, they're discouraged from, from raising any objections in meetings um, or, and certainly publicly, um, while at the same time, they're being encouraged by their superiors to speak out against this amendment. So, um, that's, that's worrying. Um, and I asked this officer what would happen if he did make his make the case for this reform to Congress, and he said, um, quote, it would kill my chances of ever having a good job again. Um, and, and then he said it would be the end of his career. So that's, that, you know, that's really concerning. No, it is. It, it, it is it's, you know, you see the intrinsic problem of this hierarchical chain of command. One, it is preventing justice from being done when it comes to sexual assault. It is also preventing good people who want to do the good thing from actually literally being able to speak out against this. Uh, it, 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 it is it is pretty pretty frightening when you look at how, how controlled that actually is. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's concerning 
um, to think that Congress may be, or the, the Senate may be weighing this decision without having heard a representative range of opinions from the military. If all they're hearing from the military is that it's going to destroy good order and discipline and that the commander's authority is absolutely essential, um, of course they're going to be concerned about the reform. Uh, and if they don't know, that there are officers who believe that, in fact, um, it won't destroy good order and discipline and that it will, in fact, um, help uh, restore the, the order and discipline that's been lost because of the sexual assault crisis. That's an important voice that they should hear. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to Zoe Carpenter from The Nation magazine, thenation.com. You actually wrote... Not that long before that, earlier in the month, on the same in the same area of to uh, of topic of sexual assault in the military, you actually wrote on how victims of sexual assault not only receive can receive trouble from their chain of command, but also in receiving treatment from the VA. Tell us all about that. Sure. So um, once once they're veterans. Um, seeking treatment for PTSD related to sexual assault, there, um, there's a big gap in the people who receive benefits from the VA for PTSD based on sexual assault versus other things. So if your PTSD is based upon combat trauma, you are much more likely to receive the benefits than if you do um, report your PTSD and relate it to uh, sexual assault. And one of the reasons for that is that the VA requires a higher burden of proof for sexual um, assault. You have to prove that it happened um, or and have some kind of paper trail. And because so many of these cases go unreported, there often isn't a paper trail. Um, and many of these uh, crimes never go to trial, so there isn't a conviction. And so it's very difficult to prove that link between PTSD and sexual assault. It's so it's so horrible, uh, you know. Uh, again, like that that in every single way, it seems like you're making this hard for people who are victims, and that, and and then like it seems like the very least that we as a nation can do is when people are, you know, when veterans come home, take care of them in every single way and take care of the, the, the trauma and the stress that they had. And clearly, uh, you know, sexual assault is something that is quite traumatic and actually requires a lot of, a lot of help and treatment and to make them jump through hoops, not even jump through hoops, but actually be having to constantly run up against a brick wall to receive treatment. Again, is something that that's so unbelievably immoral. It is. Um, and, and these are things that could be fixed too. Um, you know, the VA has lowered the burden of proof for other types of trauma. So, it, you know, it, it, there's no reason not to make the burden of proof equal for survivors of sexual trauma. Um, of course, we also have to um, combat things on the other end. We want to keep sexual assaults from happening in the military. Um, so it needs to be sort of full-spectrum reforms to, to dealing with these kinds of issues.